Hello, everybody. Welcome to Drupal as a Data Warehouse, everybody into the data lake. Today, we're gonna share our experience with data reporting in Drupal. Oh no, it's not working. For those who don't recognize the name on this quote, Edward Tufte is an American statistician and is Professor Emeritus of Political Science, Statistics, and Computer Science at Yale University. He's best known for his writings on information design, and he's also a pioneer in the field of data visualization, and we thought we'd share this quote because it seemed appropriate to the talk. So my name is Gail. This is a picture of me and my siblings in 1999 hanging out my dad's barn door during a very long family photo shoot on my parents' 50th wedding anniversary. I'm the one in the maroon shirt down in your right-hand corner. Um, I'm the baby of the family. <clears throat> I decided that being the baby makes me one of those customers. You know, the ones I'm talking about, always asking why or why not. Um, researching what Drupal can do and then pushing for product changes that suit my needs and probably don't suit anybody else's. Learning just enough along the way about Drupal, HTML and CSS to be a little bit dangerous and being pretty annoying about all of it. And if you ask these guys when I'm out of earshot, they'll probably say the same thing. I'm okay with having that reputation with my developers, um, and I mostly think they're okay with me too because over the past five years, we've established that I pretty much care about Ethos CE, which is my learning management system, as much as DLC, the developers do. We use our learning management system, or LMS, to pull together the various types of education we provide, making it easier to track progress and outcomes and to report annually for accreditation compliance purposes. In the past, we would spend weeks um, prepping reports to upload into our accrediting body's reporting system. So having everything in one place and having a pre-built report for that, it's just been life-changing for us, which sounds kind of dramatic, but I mean, you have no idea how much work it was to pull all of that together manually. Part of our educational mandate is to prove in the form of written needs assessment that our educational content is of real value to our learners. So we've always relied very heavily on reporting of pre and post test outcomes, post activity surveys, feedback and reflection forms, and so on. Um, needs assessment is really the backbone of why and how we create content in the first place. And being in the medical, medical education world, I can't leave out grants reconciliation. We have to prove to the people who provide educational money for some of our content that we've accomplished what we set out to do, and we have to report from those activities, and so that's the foundation of building an effective outcome submission for grantors. The old version of Ethos CE was based on an educationally oriented platform, really tied us to some very specific course formats and reporting capabilities, and so when DLC told us we were gonna upgrade to Drupal, um, we were pretty excited because we saw some really fantastic formatting opportunities that we didn't have before. However, we were still pretty much seeing the same reporting capabilities we'd always seen. We still had to do a lot of manual work to create a complete picture of our educational content, um, which included merging some reports, sometimes up to three, um, to get a complete picture, and nearly always had to delete columns, sometimes up to half of them, depending on the report, that weren't relevant to us, but were relevant to other customers. We also had to create visualizations in the form of charts and graphs to present to our educational oversight committees, because there's no way they would bother to even look at what you see up there, that dense, packed page of data. So for us, cookie cutter reporting really wasn't cutting it. So while we're very similar to other things that other Ethos CE customers use or do, we don't necessarily do it exactly the same way or need exactly the same reporting. So we did have some reports with custom fields on them, which wasn't necessarily cheap for us because it was custom work. And it really created extra work for the developers, especially when there was a new deployment and they had to remember to you know, migrate that change across. And, and even with custom fields, we still weren't getting what we needed. So there is a group of Ethos CE users that has a monthly conference call. We talk about what we're doing, we share ideas, we complain, because isn't that what users do is complain. Um, and we help one another find solutions based on how we're all using the product. And in that call over and over again, reporting would come up. Every time we talked about the problem, we all agreed we should put in support tickets and ask for more or better or different reporting. 
And DLC also formed an online community, which is really nice. People can post questions and, and help each other out there. And the same questions were coming up there too. The bottom line was we were all looking for a better way to show our outcomes because we all, in one way or another, have to show those to an accrediting body. So to re-emphasize my organization's needs and the needs of others in similar organizations, we're talking about professional medical education. So we need to be sure we're meeting knowledge and practice gaps to stay relevant to our learners. And our accredited status depends heavily on our ability to effectively report on all of our educational activities in our LMS. So after several years of asking and begging and nagging, and not just from me, from other users as well, DLC started looking into how they could better meet our reporting needs. So my name is Ezra Wolf, and I serve as the product manager for Ethos CE, which is, uh, means I'm responsible for keeping customers like Gail happy. And so this is made about age seven, and um, it's not just a picture of a, of a little kid, it's a kid with a profoundly bad haircut. And it's an unfinished haircut, if you look at what <laughs> the top of the hair there. And, and so I wanted to put this here, not only because it's funny and embarrassing, um, but also because managing the product is kind of uh, like a haircut, right? Um, we have a bad product, we have a problem, it's gonna grow out, we can groom it and improve it over time. So before we go on, I just wanna talk about Ethos CE a little bit because Gail mentioned it. Um, it's a Drupal-based learning management system for continuing education. And at DLC, which is the company that produces it, we're about a staff of 12, we have three developers, so we're a pretty small shop. Um, but we have nearly a million healthcare providers who've used our system to uh, maintain continuing education. And so that means probably some of you in this room have gone to doctors or nurses or pharmacists who have gotten training for continuing education through Ethos CE, which is Drupal, so right on for that. Um, so we're really proud of, of our contribution to improving patient uh, outcomes, and we're also you know, proud to maintain a few modules as part of that. So now you know about me and the product, um, I want to describe the context for the problem that um, we're going to show how we solved. Um, what we found in our application, as Gail said, um, that most of the requirements are the same, and that's because um, we have an external regulatory agency in our world, and in fact, several of them, that kind of set the rules that we have to follow. But reports are a bit different. Everybody uses these reports for internal uses as well, so business uses and internal stakeholders and bosses and grants, and they all want them in a different way. And so as the number of customers we had on the product grew, this just became an, an onslaught of requests. And, and so um, the business problem and how it applies to Drupal is that it just doesn't scale very well. And I don't mean traffic scaling, I mean that each one of these reports is a manual work, building a custom view that a customer has requested. And we put all our views in code, so there's that whole workflow as well. Um, or we'd have some customers that would ask for an entire dump of the data the entire database because they have data scientists on staff, some of the bigger hospitals and things. But then they'd also want detailed modeling diagrams of Drupal core and all the contributed modules and all the custom modules. And then they wanted to know how it all worked, um, which is just, you know, again, we're a staff of 12. So, um, and we, we talked about and we tried um, just handing off views to, to the users at first, um, but it didn't really work because we're not a training organization. That's a, a complicated interface to learn. Um, we didn't want to provide support for it. And the few times that we did this early on, some customers created non-performative reports that basically crashed their sites by locking up MySQL. Um, so we learned pretty quickly that Views is not a customer-friendly tool, or it's not a customer-facing tool unless you have very uh, technical customers and you trust them. So we ended up building a lot of custom views, um, and it keeps us busy. But it turns out that that's not really a good thing for our organization, because the developers are developers. They're not site builders. Um, they want to write code and do challenging stuff instead of just clicking around. And then each one of these views becomes another report that we have to maintain. And when the schema changes, we have to update them. And then the customers always want to change them. So we, you know, we ended up with just dozens and dozens of custom views on top of our, our normal views. And there's really just not enough revenue from that because it became a, an opportunity cost for our business. Instead of building uh, a product that worked better for everybody, we were spending all our time um, building these custom views. So, um, with this problem, then I turn to, to Devin, who's our system architect, and ask him to fix it. So my name is Devin. I'm a systems architect. Uh, before Drupal 6, I unfortunately started with PHP 4. 
Um, it's been a long time since then, and I forgive myself for that. Um, as we said, I needed an intro slide, so I assumed it's a business requirement that I needed to fulfill. So growing up, uh, my family had ducks as pets because everybody except me was somehow allergic to everything. So no cats, no dogs, just ducks. Uh, moving on to the problem, I thought, hey, you know, this is definitely a big, big data question, right? So I just turn on all these cloud services, it all connects, it's an obvious problem to solve. So I split this up into three different phases. Uh, the first one being big data, the second one, we'll figure that out, and then the third one, we're gonna profit, and that's it. Uh, don't be the underpants gnome. Uh, have a plan for what your data is going to do, and so let's talk about the real plan. Um, our previous solutions, as mentioned, for custom reporting involved a huge suite of modules, uh, views, home box, charts, high charts, views, data exports, about 10 other views related modules that we had to you know, maintain and upgrade. Um, it worked, but as you said, we're building lots of custom views and charts for every customer, adding per customer fields and calculations every single time, which took time away from really more important Drupal development that we wanted to do. Um, as I mentioned, we didn't have the capacity to train administrators using the site who really are not interested in using the views cockpit. Um, building our own tool would have been a distraction from our core business. Um, we're not data scientists, um, but the functionality we did need uh, was charting, report saving and sharing, scheduling, uh, CSV, Excel, PDF downloads, embedded charts and reports, and also, most importantly, handling the unknown. So the reports and calculations that we didn't know about, um, but our customers would ask for in the future. So we needed a tool that we could give to customers to report on their own data, instead of us being the ones to do it. So uh, once we had figured out that we needed uh, a BI tool, we had to find the right one. Um, and this is really a much bigger task than, than I'd anticipated because the BI vendors, they don't know about serialized data in PHP. They don't know about web form, EAV storage. They don't know about continuing education. Um, they don't know about Drupal. So you know, if you're in this room and you're thinking about, about trying to find a BI tool, chances are the vendor is not gonna understand what you're, what you're doing. So it's really up to you to find the vendor um, that's the best fit for your for your uh, organization or your business. And so if there's one takeaway that, you know, that I would want to leave from you as a, as a I guess, a, the business person, it's that you need to be, uh, you need to get to a short list of vendors as soon as possible and just be brutal with your vetting because there are dozens and dozens and dozens of them out there and they all want to talk to you. Um, and then do the most vigilant and intense due diligence possible. And, and so uh, just a couple examples of things that happened to us. Um, we found out in due diligence that one vendor had showed us some really great um, web-based interfaces for viewing reports and building reports, um, required us to use a, a Windows application to, to do the developer um, side of the work. And you know, we're a Linux shop, so that was a big problem for us. And then another one, um, uh, we asked about their API roadmap, and they told us that they were working on a Python-based SDK, and that's where all their energy was going into which makes sense because Python is widely used in data science, but we're, again, we're a PHP shop and we wanted a generic uh, REST-based API. And then um, the next question was, where are we gonna put all this data? And that wasn't even something that, that I was aware of. I thought we would just find a BI tool and they would bring the data warehouse to us. And many of them do, um, but the problem with that was once you pick that one, you're sort of locked in and it also affects you know, the ability to use um, ETL tools, which is extract, transform, and load. And the ETL tools aren't cheap either. Some of them charge by the database connection. So with multiple databases, we have about 65 right now. Um, one of them wanted like $10,000 for every two or three connections, something like that. So that was just way more than our budget allowed. Our business model is software as a service, so we're not building these one-off projects for our customers and negotiating a budget. We're basically charging them a fixed fee every quarter to get the services they want. So we couldn't really go back and, and charge additional pricing for this, and we certainly couldn't add it as an add-on. Yeah, and that's where I step back in and say, um, as I said before, I work for a professional medical association. We're a nonprofit organization, and while we're not poor, we aren't rich either. And getting our board of directors to sign on the dotted line, and this is in caps in my script, for even more LMS costs is tough. In theory, they really do get that if we have the tech, we have to maintain and upgrade it, but adding features, especially ones they don't necessarily understand and don't sound all that important to them, is really hard. So we have to decide what we can justify and what we can't. And paying to retrieve our own data is not something they would sign off on. 
So with all that in mind, um, we needed to pick our products and to do so, we really needed to dive in to how we were gonna pull this off. Um, so the first questions we had were, could we point a, to a tool at Drupal and have it report as is out of the box? And you know, did we even need a data warehouse? Um, to answer the question about why reporting on Drupal out of the box is not optimal, um, we have to look at how the data is stored. So refresher for some, uh, you're in your first SQL 101 class and you're reading through the first tutorial, uh, you're asked to make a table of people and who their employer is. And for most assignments, not really a real world example, but this is probably how you would have structured that table. Um, a field for user ID, name, employer, and it does work, but certain bits of data are duplicated across rows. Um, you'd have to manually update the records or do some sort of textual find and replace in order to update a company's name for all affected users. Um, so, you know, take a name change, for example, you gotta make three updates. Um, either manually in your system or with some query. And it might not take very long, um, but at scale, however, when there's lots of creation and updates happening at the same time, you, know, you end up with table or row locking and it could affect the performance of your site. You also can run into data drift, um, just in case the final replace goes bad. Um, this isn't very good data design and we have to normalize the data. So the process of normalizing reduces data redundancy and improves data integrity. Um, we eliminate columns with duplicate data by creating separate tables. We identify the data with a key. Um, we move data that's not related to the primary key. So for example, um, the person's employer is not directly relevant to the person themselves, um, which is why we didn't even put the employer ID relation column on the people table. And designing normalized databases like this means that removing the employer functionality from a system doesn't require modifying the base people table. And the same would go if you wanted to add new fields and functionality. So Drupal itself does this along with many contributed modules. Um, the core tables are pretty static um, while the add-on functionality uh, uses relation tables for data storage. So you know, if we look at an example of how we can efficiently store you know, a user, a full name, some location information, and an employer, um, you know, we start with the user table, we apply the normalization techniques that we talked about, and we end up with about seven tables necessary to store the data. And we can see why Drupal suggests managing fields and data this way. Um, custom fields can be added to just about anything that uses the uh, field API. And uh, Drupal allows us to expand upon the base tables without altering the structure. Um, it also allows us to update only one row in this um, table versus an unknown number of rows if you know, the company name changed. So that's the basic concept of normalization and why we do it. Um, even though we're not talking about code here, I think that's kind of an example of not hacking core because you're not trying to alter the definition of core tables, but instead you're safely extending them. Um, so don't hack core, includes the database. Uh, create a new table, uh, use keys to add your own functionality. It's good design. Okay, but uh, we just talked about normalization and this talk is about denormalization and why we need it. So let me introduce the next problem. Table structure we just looked at got pretty complicated really fast, and it's gonna be really hard to write queries against it, or as Ezra said, tell a BI vendor how to write queries against it. And doing 10 million entity loads to you know, get a whole bunch of data is gonna take so long no matter how optimized your site is. And if you have to do this on a schedule, it's unlikely you'd be able to get updated data to your customers in near real time. So the structure, although very good for a production database, is not good when you need to pipe this data to an external system that isn't Drupal. Um, the complexities in this design uh, would also have to be understood in the reporting tool. And if your third party system or reporting tool is doing all the processing necessary, you're then locked into whatever tool that is. So to summarize, our operational database, which is Drupal, optimized for fast writes and data integrity. It holds data, but the relation model is not informative, and that means without assistance, you likely won't be able to answer a question about the data, like a count or an average or something split by another value. So our proposed reporting database is gonna be optimized for fast reads. Uh, it's gonna hold more information. Uh, the relational model is going to be simple, um, so it's more apparent to users and also machines. So we needed a module that could work with our Drupal data and get it into a format that would be conducive for BI tools. And uh, very early on, I wrote a bit of code just as a proof of concept. Um, and then I Googled to make sure that you know, there wasn't anything else doing it and you know, my sandbox was the first thing to show up. Uh, so there was really nothing out there that could do this. And I'll leave it up to anyone else to decipher what that means about there being nothing else to do this. So the denormalizer module uh, pulls from Drupal's entity information, defined schema, you can also pass it external tables, and it will programmatically build denormalized tables or views for use in data warehousing. So simple example, uh, we have a node of type chinchilla, we provide denormalizer with the denormalized table name, the entity type to denormalize, primary key to use, and the change key to use. What this is going to do is create a new table in a new database which contains all of the nodes of type chinchilla with all attached fields flattened into one row. Uh, we also pull in the vote table here, uh, which probably doesn't have to be denormalized, but it would be included in the processing. 
So the queries that are generated by this module uh, look a little bit like this. And um, you know, if you've ever had SQL preview on in views, uh, it's very similar, lots of joins. Um, but instead of taking this and rendering it to the user as content, we're dumping the raw data into a table for further processing. So after configuring and running denormalizer, the resulting tables in our new database are only going to contain this denormalized data. So back to our simple example that involved a lot of joins, uh, it's now stored in a denormalized format with no joins. So this makes it much faster and easier to relate to other data in a data warehouse. Um, you don't want to run the denormalization process on an entire data set all the time. And so on subsequent runs, it'll only update or insert brand new and changed records. So we defined those keys back when we set up our uh, hook info, which currently there's no UI for that yet, but that'll come later. Um, denormalizer records the water level. So on the next cron run, uh, we start back where we left off and we insert those records. Uh, so this is really useful when you're working with data sets in the millions um, and doing a full table reload is gonna be detrimental to performance or um, would make your reporting uh, not in real time if it takes too long. So at this point, uh, we created a new database in production uh, with denormalized tables based on Drupal's own knowledge and combined with our own knowledge about how our data is supposed to be structured. And only the data that you want exposed is in the new database, contains the new tables, and the complicated structures like fields have been flattened. So at this point, if you wanted to, you could point a tool at this database, although it's not really the most ideal. Um, you'd probably want to read only replica to handle queries so you know, it doesn't take your site down. But you know, let's say you don't want to have uh, you want to have MySQL as your operating database, but you want to use PostgreSQL or Athena or BigQuery or some other system, some other system as a reporting database. And maybe you want to bring in other sorts of data that's not related to Drupal. For example, we might want SendGrid data for tracking message opens or bounces based off the user's email. Uh, Google ad data to see how effective ads were. Um, so we needed a plan to pull in this data and then expose it and then utilize it in other systems. So for this, uh, we have to change our approach a little bit and introduce something that resembles a data lake. Um, it's an aggregation of multiple sources of data. Uh, the technology used in building your data lake depends on what you want to process. Um, for us, it's a lot of relational data. Um, for others, it may be document storage. But simply put, uh, the contents of a data lake uh, stream in from a source to fill the lake, and various users of the lake can come to examine, dive in, or take samples. So now that we're not using our operational database, during that denormalization process, um, we can do some alters based on your own needs um, and do some things that really should not be done in an operational database, um, like MySQL 5.7 and PostgreSQL have you know, array and JSON type fields that can store multiple values without having to create subtables. Um, in the case of multiple value fields, we can unnest them later in a reporting database. Um, we can store parents in a more reportable, hierarchical way. Um, you can report more easily on trees of data. Um, in data warehousing, we really don't care about enforcing referential integrity like our operating database would. Um, we just care about the data getting into the system. So denormalizer will also give you the ability to transform data um, in the case of any other processes that might involve manual extraction. Um, some of those examples might be you know, dates if you want to convert all your Unix times to ISO times, um, key to value translations for um, you know, translating keys to user values. Um, and then everyone's favorite, you know, PHP serialized data. Um, so, while data lakes and warehouses can be similar, um, without getting too in-depth, there's some simple ideas that make them different. Um, with the data lake, you're retaining all the source data in one place because you don't know what you're gonna use it for. Uh, you discourage creating data silos, um, which can hold back data from those who need it due to technical or other barriers um, that may also make the data stale and turn into data swamp. Um, a warehouse is generally reserved for processed data with a specific purpose. Um, so you may want to create a data warehouse that contains user demographics and nothing else. Um, you might then have another data warehouse that has orders and products but not demographics. Um, you could have multiple systems being populated from the same lake. So we want to get all this data in one place to crunch some data, but how do we get it there? How do we pull something from somewhere else and put it into this database? And if you've had any experience with data warehousing, you've probably come across many acronyms. I mentioned before one of them being BLT or ETL or ELT. Um, but simply put, it's extracting data from your source transforming it via some process, and then loading it into a target. And recently, uh, extract the data from your source, load it into a target, and then do transformations. Um, it's, people mix them around now. So we need to do this. We need a system to extract the information from a variety of sources and put them into one system. So after evaluating a few proprietary and uh, sometimes expensive ETL systems, uh, we decided to try this relatively new project called Singer. Um, Singer is the open source standard for writing scripts that move data, um, which is exactly what we want to do. So the Singer ecosystem consists of taps and targets. Um, so you could have a MySQL tap for an external database, uh, a tap for Drupal's database, and then a tap for SendGrid emails, Google Ads. Um, there's a whole bunch of projects that support the Singer specification that will pull data. 
So let's say you want to pull in which nodes have the most hits and then compare them to clicks that were tracked in SendGrid to see if uh, the emails for the, were the reason for the traffic. Um, each tap and target is its mini application. Um, they communicate via a JSON specification. So your taps and targets can really be written in any language. Um, so here's the high level overview. Uh, the tap will extract information from the source. There's a catalog.json file, um, which is generated with a drush command using the Singer drush uh, module. Uh, and it contains information about the structure of the data that we want to replicate. Um, so the target takes in data from the tap and then transforms it to what the target needs. So it could be CSV, Google Sheets, PostgreSQL, um, whatever. The target then outputs the state that the tap sent over, and that marks the water level or the last replication point that we talked about. And so the state is then passed back to the tap on the next subsequent run, and then the process continues at the last replication point. So this is running constantly and constantly pulling data and putting it into this lake. So the theme of this presentation is making sense, right? Like dives, water level, taps, streams, lakes. <laughs> yeah, okay. Um, so here's a high level overview, how this all comes together. Um, we can use Singer streams in additional ways too. Um, so we're continually populating a central repository with Singer. Um, so we can pull in all our sources, put them in the data lake, and then we can decide where it has to go later. Uh, Singer already knows the data format because Drupal generated this Singer catalog JSON file, um, which described the structure and all the field types of the normalized tables. And once you have that catalog file, you can replicate this data anywhere anywhere that uh, has a Singer target. Um, the target doesn't know where the data is coming from, it only sees it in the Singer format. Um, to add another example here, literally just an hour ago in another presentation based on AI, um, we had a requirement to dump data into Amazon S3 so we could run AWS Macy on this, on this giant set. Um, and with a Singer target of S3, we can just pipe what we're already pulling in and send that over to S3. So, our solution in the end, um, Drupal is being used to denormalize data into another database on production, combined with Singer being used to pull in third-party data also in the same location as the Drupal database. Our production database is on AWS Aurora, which is like a souped up MySQL if you don't know. Um, that also provides a read-only replica of the lake, uh, which includes all customer data, all of our customers' data. Um, Singer extracts, Singer again, extracts and loads data from a read-only copy of MySQL to a PostgreSQL data warehouse. Um, Looker was our selected business intelligence tool um, that's used to transform and build reports on data. The customer modeling is generated um, from Drupal um, based on the customer's custom fields and configurations so we can provision uh, custom dashboards based on their configured fields. Um, we have about 100 million rows being processed. Um, the majority of that data comes from Drupal courses, quizzes, and web form activity. Um, it's about 1.5 million quiz attempts, 1.5 million web form submissions. Um, and it's replicating data from about 35,000 web forms. <laughs> so while all that technical work, work was happening um, in the background, um, I had to go and interview our customers um, to understand the product requirements of how we were gonna deliver all this data to them. Um, we mocked up dashboards, we took them to our user group meeting, we posted them in the online community, we then did a proof of concept and beta tested it, we developed a training, we beta tested the training, um, and we ended up delivering 18 new dashboards that are all directly embedded in Drupal. Um, so we have single sign-on authentication with the business intelligence engine. Um, when the user logs into Drupal, they're automatically uh, logged into the, the BI tool. But the, the number of reports really isn't important here. It's kind of meaningless because we also rolled out self-service reporting, meaning that customers like Gale can um, generate as many reports as they want in whatever format they want. Um, in addition, the, the integration here with the BI um, and Drupal became a strong competitive advantage for us over, over our competitors. Um, you know, the sales team got really, really excited about this. Um, it definitely moved the needle for them, um, and it eventually became one of the key competitive differentiators in, in terms of winning sales. Um, plus, building reports is really fun. If, you, if you've ever done this, um, it's very, uh, I, I'll just give an example, which is when we first got our data into the BI tool, I basically lost the entire weekend sitting in my living room just building report after report after report. And we, you know, we always had plenty of data, but we didn't have great information about that data. And, and so this gave us the ability to, to do data discovery and turn that data into information, which is really, really valuable in understanding how our customers use the system and how the end user learners use the system. But finally, and this is my favorite part of, the, of this whole project, is that the developers don't build custom reports at all anymore. Um, our support desk manager has become, you know, sort of deeply invested in this BI tool. She loves it, and she's able to build these reports now, usually in minutes, like if a customer wants something custom, 
and, and we often don't even charge, usually we don't charge them for it. So something that used to take weeks in terms of the development cycle, um, you know, now takes minutes and it used to cost hundreds or, you know, low thousands of dollars to build reports as, you know, we do for free. So it's been a really great success story for, for us. I know it was a ton of work on the development side, and they were really patient with all of us on the customer side who were pushing and pushing and pushing for something better. And um, I can't tell you how much our, the customers appreciate the work that these guys put in to give us a better reporting option. Um, and while there are still things that need to be worked out on the development and the user sides, we still um, have, we had issues until about, what, three weeks ago with pulling SCORM data out of SCORM files, but we're working on it and it's working well now, so that's good. Um, we really appreciate the work they put in and it's been a huge leap forward for all of us. Um, now on those calls, we don't have um, complaints about reporting, which is nice too. Um, so they took the plunge and they convinced us to follow them. And with really great success, that's, that's them on your left and the customers on the right, by the way. Um, so now we're inviting you to join us in the data lake because the water's fine. Um. I'll, I'll post these slides online later, um, but here's some resources, all the projects that we used. Um, some of these are just approaching maturity, like a lot of this stuff like really isn't that stable yet, um, but you know, it's a work in progress. Um, check out Singer, check out the taps. Um, there's a nice uh, blog about Singer and Looker, which is specifically what we use to integrate. Um, you don't have to use Looker, you can use whatever you want. Um, join us for con uh, contribution opportunities tomorrow, and uh, thanks for coming. Oh, fill out the survey too, please. Thanks. Yeah, sorry, we had no time for questions. Yeah, but we can, yeah. <laughs>